Good afternoon. I'm back. All right, in case you missed my first talk on acute decompensated heart failure, my name is Peter Pang, and I chair the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine. And I'm pleased to be able to come back and kind of finish up my talk on acute decompensated heart failure by talking about cardiogenic shock. Here are my disclosures. Now, so of course, when you talk about cardiogenic shock, you have to begin with, can you really die of a broken heart? And in fact, you can come pretty darn close, or yes, and oftentimes um, that's what some of you have seen as a taco subo cardiomyopathy. We're actually not going to get into that that much, but just to kind of illustrate a point is that the heart is an amazing engine. Think about it, right? It can run for a hundred years on biofuel, right? Five liters a minute, 130,000 beats a day, 35 million beats a year. It's an impressive organ, and even more so impressive, or perhaps that's why we notice it when things don't go as well as we would hope. So in my acute decompensated heart failure talk, I talked about when you see a patient who comes in with what you think is acute decompensated heart failure, put the patient into three broad categories, systemic volume overload, hypertensive heart failure, and then that low output failure or cardiogenic shock. Right? Oftentimes what you'll see, and you know this in practicing in the emergency department, right, is you've got a patient that you're worried is not perfusing, and you're trying to figure out why. Right? So you're thinking about hemorrhagic shock, septic shock, right? but another one that you're thinking about is cardiogenic shock right? or in low output failure. We're going to talk about um, the management of cardiogenic shock. I took a lot of this from this consensus and scientific statement, which I wanted to put up as a review as well as from recommendations from the European Society of um, Cardiology. But before I dig into this, I did want to mention one thing, is that for patients with advanced heart failure, so they're on maximal medical therapy, oftentimes a device has been implanted, right? A lot of times they walk around on a daily basis with a low blood pressure. And so you just want to be careful when you're seeing these patients in the emergency department, and it's very hard to sometimes tell, are they actually at their baseline? Because oftentimes we in the emergency department haven't seen them before, or are they different than where they were before? Are they now in shock? And oftentimes we can tell this as we do our evaluation and workup is at least some evidence of worsening end organ injury which could be sometimes subtle. It might be an altered mental status that's subtle, or other things that we can see quite clearly, like worsening acute kidney injury. So unlike that hypertensive heart failure patient who's often sitting up, short of breath, blood pressure sky high, they're sweating, you're not going to see that in the cardiogenic shock patient. So often you, you've probably heard these categories of like warm and dry, warm and wet, cold and dry, cold and wet. This is the dreaded cold and wet, right? They're cold because they're not perfusing. So their skin feels cold and they're wet. They're volume overloaded. Your usual armamentarium about thinking of let's give diuretic therapy, let's give vasodilators, let's think about non-invasive ventilation. When you don't have the blood pressure room, you have to tread much more carefully. This is that example. I, I like this slide. I stole it from a speaker. I can't remember who it was, so I want to give credit to them. A great example of jugular venous distension. Look at those neck veins, right? But essentially what you're looking at here is this patient, well, probably they're not that angry, but you know, they're cold, they're wet, and they have jugular venous distension, right? So this might clue you in with that low blood pressure should you be thinking about cardiogenic shock. We're not going to go over this slide. The only I put it up here is just to say it's complicated, right? The pathophysiology of cardiogenic shock is complicated. I'm just going to tell you what are the five things you want to remember, which actually took actually from a relatively older 2014 from the European Heart Journal guidelines. These are the five things, right? You're thinking about medical therapy with vasopressors, inotropes. You're considering ventilatory support, but you know this from working in the emergency department when that's necessary. These are the two final things, even though they're listed lower, actually could be the most important, right? Why are they in cardiogenic shock? That's the piece that you have to get their treatment 
quite quickly. Remember, they're presenting in shock. It's not that you have an overabundance of time. I don't want to say you have no time, but this is where you quickly want to be able to make that diagnosis to get the patient to definitive care. And those five things to remember, you can see in this algorithm, are at the top, circled in yellow. Patient has come in with cardiogenic shock. This is another way of looking at a more updated version, essentially, of those guidelines. I'm, again, I won't go through it. I just provided you for reference. You know, sometimes I'll even print it out as something to carry around with me if I'm thinking, how am I going to manage these patients? These patients are complicated. And this is something where wherever you work, you want to, ahead of time, have some kind of working arrangement, either with a referral hospital or the hospital that you're working in, how you will manage these patients. Right? Because again, they're complicated, they're sick, and depending on what they need, they're often going to need a higher level of care than we can provide in the emergency department. Our goal is to stabilize them to get to definitive care. So when I talked about those five things, I'm going to build a house for you to think, I've got a patient in cardiogenic shock. They're cold and wet. You've thought about other things like sepsis, like hemorrhagic shock, right, for why the patient has come in. Less common is the cardiogenic shock, and it's that cold, right, that really helps you make the diagnosis. This is how you're going to build that house, thinking how to manage it. You know this already? You're thinking about the ABCs, right, airway and breathing, right? And then you're thinking about, if necessary, right, first is drug therapy. You want to stabilize the patient so they can get the definitive care and you can figure out what's going on, especially when that blood pressure is low. Right? And they either have altered mental status or worsening organ dysfunction. You don't want that to continue and to spiral out of control. Right? You're then thinking about revascularization and reperfusion therapy. And then finally, and now this is even making me dizzy looking at these slides I'm spinning around like this, is potential mechanical therapy, a balloon pump, mechanical circulatory support like a VAD may be necessary depending on the circumstances. I deliberately made this house this way with these three pillars, with drug therapy, oddly enough, being the smallest pillar. Because it could be, again, if it's occluded, epicardial artery, right? So essentially, if you have coronary artery disease or STEMI, that's the cause of your cardiogenic shock, right? You'll make that diagnosis with an EKG, but that's essential, right? If it's a mechanical issue like a valve rupture, then it's mechanical therapy that's necessary. And at times, if the shock is so bad and they need essentially artificial support, some form of mechanical circulatory support, that also is going to be necessary. Right? Our drug therapy is actually only a small piece to really get to that more definitive diagnostic workup and ensure they get to care. So how do you go about doing this and figuring out what they need? One of the things I would do first is point of care ultrasound. I'll admit, I am not one of the world's um, best echocard echocardiographers by any stretch of the imagination doing this at the bedside. But I think that even um, with my lack of expertise at it, you can see the difference between the left and the right images. You almost see a heart, right? I believe this is your right side. It might be your left side of your screen. Um, I always get that confused, essentially. But you see a heart that's almost barely moving versus the other screen, the other side of the screen. You can see that almost, I don't want to say it's hyperdynamic. That's not right. But essentially, you see good squeeze, right? And that contrast oftentimes is all you need to know to take a look at that and say, hey, the heart isn't working as well as it could be, right? I'm not suggesting you're going to make that diagnosis of valvular dysfunction. I'm not saying you're going to see a wall motion abnormality. Um, that's not something that I would feel comfortable doing, but I have no doubt that some of you in the audience can do that very, very well. This is what helps me understand first, is it a cardiogenic or potential cardiogenic cause of shock, right? But this also then, when I see it, raises my suspicion and concern I need to try to figure out, is there something else going on with the patient that I need to get help with or intervene with quickly from a mechanical problem or a potential reperfusion revascularization problem? And in fact, that's what the recommendations show, right? Emergency echocardiography is a class one, even though it's um, level of evidence C, expert opinion. Essentially, this is what you want to do up front in a cardiogenic shock patient. Of course, you need to stabilize the patient sufficiently to get this done at the bedside. More than anything else will help you get to definitive management. Think about point of care ultrasound, both up front to help you with the diagnosis, but then to help guide your therapy next. Of course, next requires actually that you get the patient to next, and that involves stabilizing the patient oftentimes with um, drug therapy, vasopressors or inotropes.
Unfortunately, there are no definitive randomized controlled trials to say which is better. Or at least there's not great ones, I guess I would say. Um, when we look at inotropic therapy, there actually has been a more recent study looking at milrinone compared with dobutamine. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's actually a relatively recent publication, and this comes from their kind of like overall figure. And there was no between-group differences in the primary composite outcome in these 192 patients who were admitted to the ICU with cardiogenic shock treated with milrinone or dobutamine. What this tells me, and I had traditionally almost always used dobutamine over milrinone, is because I don't see a ton of these patients, despite working in a tertiary and quaternary referral center. When in doubt, I think it's good to go with what you know, as opposed to do something completely different. Right. For me, I would reach for dobutamine. And now you have evidence to support you that there is no difference in outcomes for these patients with cardiogenic shock. Right? You always have to be wary a little bit when giving this agent, uh, oddly enough, of worsening hypotension, which is a possibility. Um, but when you need inotropic therapy, you need inotropic therapy. Again, you're doing this to try to buy you time, right? So that the patient can get further managed and worked up to see how can we get this patient better. So again, consider dobutamine. I put an initial dose here, two to 20 mics per kg per minute. Oftentimes, you're also thinking about vasopressors, and the one to reach for is norepinephrine. Similar to what you're doing in septic shock, it's a drug that you're used to. Think about norepinephrine. This very busy slide is not all that helpful, only to suggest to you that inotropes are associated with a worse outcome. You know, that's not too surprising, right? Because the patients are sick to begin with, right? However, it's just to say that it's a temporizing measure, right? Patient's blood pressure is low, right? They have evidence of end organ damage. You need to get the blood pressure up. So from the emergency department standpoint, go ahead, reach for the dobutamine, reach for the norepinephrine as needed. Just remember that ultimately that's not the answer and that will prompt you for, I need to do a further workup to figure out what exactly is going on. So what about mechanical therapy, such as a balloon pump, right? So it's been postulated, and at least an earlier study suggests it's better coronary blood flow, increased organ perfusion. It had a class one recommendation until they went to the shock two trial that actually showed there was no benefit to the balloon pump. I'm not the person that's gonna be putting the balloon pump in. I don't want to say that you should never do it or the evidence suggests that. Rarely are there never and always in medicine. Again, you've got a sick patient. Right, alive, I mean, you know this, alive is better than dead, right? If you have to temporize to get the patient where you need to go, right? By that time, of course, they're out of your hands. They're with the interventionalist and a balloon pump is being put in. If this is what's needed to figure out what's going on, work with your team carefully to figure that out. All right, my rotating house, right? So we've talked about you've made the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock. They're cold and they're wet. It's not like a septic shock patient that's warm, vasodilated, and has a fever. They're cold, they're wet, the blood pressure is often quite low. You're thinking about, of course, the airway and breathing first as a foundation of your house. You're using point of care ultrasound to see, hey, the heart doesn't have a whole lot of squeeze, and it's reminding you, I've got to think about getting an emergency echo if that's not in your skill set, which I don't necessarily expect it to be, though I think we have a rising generation of emergency physicians where it is. And you're doing that again for these two pillars of your house of therapy as you're thinking about, does the patient need mechanical therapy? Do they need revascularization, reperfusion? That's when you should be calling for help and consultation or transferring the patient out. Our domain is that drug therapy, in addition to that airway and breathing, in order to temporize the patient to get to definitive care. So once again, this is my email address. I hope you think happy thoughts. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.